Good morning, Covenant. Good morning. And thank you, Pastor, for such a blessed opportunity. I don't take it for granted. This is a blessing, first of all, to me, to my family, and of course, to the body of Christ. In his commentary on the Gospel of Luke, Dr. Philip Ryken writes about the story of a girl, a young girl. He says, Elizabeth's story is a profile in Christian courage. She was raised in a small village in Southeast Asia, where her parents taught her to trust God for her daily needs and where she dreamed of getting a good education. When she was 16, a relative offered to her to help her find a high paying job in another country so that she could help her family and earn the money she needed for college. Dr. Riken continues saying what Elizabeth didn't know, however, was that her relative would betray her into the sex trade. When she reached the border, she, saw, she was sold into slavery and taken to a house of prostitution. Seven months later, by the mercy of God, investigators from the International Justice Mission found Elizabeth and persuaded the local police to raid the house where she was being held against her will. When the rescuers arrived, they found something written on the wall of her room. Are you ready? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my soul. Of whom shall I be afraid? When I read stories like this, I do have the right to ask three questions. Is it true? Is it real? A young girl, alone, sold, captive, abused, dreams shattered, still having her eyes fixed on the one whom she believes is her light and salvation and the strength of her life? Is it real? The testimonies of the life of the saints of the Old Testament and also of the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts, proves it to be right. It's real. The second question is this. How can it be? How does it work? There is one and only one explanation. God gives grace. Rather, God showers grace on his beloved ones. And the third question I can ask is this. Why? It doesn't happen to everyone. In all the cases, why it does happen in this case? And this is the answer. Because in his eyes, you are precious. Very precious. Because these children of God, they are of more value than many sparrows. And this is the title of my sermon. You are of more value than many sparrows. I invite you to open your Bibles to the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 to 31, which was printed in your bulletins. This is the word of the Lord. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of the household? 
so have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say it in light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather feel, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you as sinners who are saved by your grace. We needed your grace, your saving grace, when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. And even now, as born-again believers, still we need your sanctifying grace. This morning, during our time in your word, Please shower us with your grace to comprehend how wide and long and high and deep is your love. I ask you these things because of Christ and for your glory. Amen. As you see in your bulletins, my sermon has three parts, three sections, the context, and then I'm going to go to discuss the value of a sparrow in the eyes of men and in the eyes of God, and then end up with the main point of my sermon, the value of a child of God in the eyes of men and in the eyes of God. The first part, context. They say, when you are studying the scriptures, the most important part is to get the context. Truly so, we need to know what, ha what has been happening from the beginning of chapter 10 till the part I started reading. If you look at Matthew 10 from the beginning, you will see these things happening. Jesus called to him his 12 disciples. Jesus is sending them out to do two things, to preach and to do miracles. And it's so interesting. He is equipping them to do both. To preach, he's giving them sermon. And sermon is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And to be able to do the miracles to heal the sick, he's giving them authority, power. They are completely equipped. They lack nothing. To this point, they can sing Psalm 23. Then Jesus gives them severe warnings. And I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples. Try to imagine, picture it. Disciples are there, 12 disciples, and they are ready to be sent, sent out. And Jesus is giving them warnings, one after the other. Put yourselves in their shoes. What would you think? How would be your feeling when you are hearing these warnings? Not everyone will receive you. You might say, oops, so it's not going to be easy. And someone might tell you, oh, don't worry. He also said, shake off your dust, go somewhere else. We can go somewhere else. Okay. Jesus adds, you are being sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What? Have you imagined a sheep in the midst of wolves? Do you know what it means? It means they are sitting at the table to eat. Then he goes on saying, wolves will deliver you to the synagogues. Synagogues, religious leaders, Pharisees, and scribes. Aren't these the same guy who are trying to trap you, against you, arguing with you, hating you, 
Yep. The same. Then he goes on saying, you will be dragged before governors and kings. Oh my goodness. First of all, he said, people around, around us are neighbors. Not everyone will receive us. Then he talked about religious leaders, Jewish, and now he's talking about pagan Gentiles, even those people. Someone might say, hey, Lord, do you think you missed someone to be against us? He says, you will be hated by your family members. Oh, and now family members. They will deliver you to death, your family. And when we study that context, we rightly come to the conclusion saying, oh, man, this is scary. This is fearful. That's it. That's the context. That's the context. It is scary. It is fearful. That's why we find Jesus saying to them, in the passage I read to you, three times he's saying, fear not, fear not, fear not. In the beginning of the t- passage, in the middle, and at the end. Technically, Jesus is saying, it is given to you as a blessing to partake in my sufferings. It, because in verse number 25, we read, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. You are being given opportunity in the midst of the hardship. Maybe that's why Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering. Maybe that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 4.13, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The context is saying us, is telling us, Jesus is helping them understand, you will be ministering my cause. You will be persecuted for my sake. You will be partaking in my suffering. Ready? You should go. This is the context. Get ready. But it doesn't end here. Then he starts talking about something. We don't usually hear about this stuff. Sparrow. A bird. Let's see. What is a sparrow in the eyes of man and then in the eyes of God? Verse 29. Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? This word, this Greek word, which is translated penny in different languages is translated as penny, cent, copper coin, Asar, Asarian, because the Greek word is Asarian. Most commentators believe this word, this Greek word, which in our text is translated penny, is one sixteenth of one denarius. One denarius was wages of just one day work, labor of one day, one denarius. And commentators believe this penny was worth one sixteenth of one denarius. And don't forget, this is the price for two sparrows. How much is one sparrow then? Okay, one out of 32. This was in the eyes of men. It was almost as nothing, but not nothing. Something, but not very exciting news about that price. When we go to Luke chapter 12, verse 6, we get more information. 
in Luke 12, 6, in the same context, the same passage, the same topic, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And the critics of our faith, right here, they say, I got you. Your word is not the Bible, the word of God. There is something wrong with it. Because if in Matthew it says, two sparrows are sold for one penny. If you spend two pennies, you will get four sparrows. This is mathematics. So they conclude, oh, something wrong with your Bible. And if I have the critic here, I would look at him and say, Mr. Critic, could you step aside, please? And take some classes in business, in marketing. Because as a seller, I will encourage you to spend more money by saying, hey, if you spend one penny, I'm going to give you two sparrows. But if you spend two pennies, I'm going to give you five. By far, by four, get one free. <laughs> so you will get five. Now, in Matthew, we didn't get it quite right as far as the price of a sparrow. We said, we cannot say it's nothing. It was something. One of 30 seconds of a denarius. In Luke, we get a bit better picture. Some of the sparrows were worthless. Nothing. Free. That's the way sparrows are in the eyes of the world. How about sparrows in the eyes of God? Beautiful. Matthew 10, 29, part B. And none of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Luke 12, 6, part B. And none of them is forgotten before God. It's just a living creature, a bird. In the morning, you try to feed them. Do you think because you feed them, they are alive? Someone else is feeding them. God, their creator, knows them, feeds them. Read Psalm 104, verses 27 to 29. He is feeding them. He pays attention to their detailed needs. They won't die, according to the text, fall to the ground apart from our heavenly Father's will. He is sovereignly ruling over their being, coming into existence, living the short life, and dying. All of them, and none of them, is forgotten in the eyes of your Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, their God, their Creator. When Jesus talks about these sparrows, we need to be very careful because we might come to the conclusion and saying, you know what? The Bible, it seems, is teaching me I can take it allegorically as if I'm a sparrow. You see, the way he's taking care of the sparrows, he has pr promised exactly to take care of me. Not quite right. Why? When we go to the last part, which is my main point of the sermon, the value of a child of God. Verses number 30 and 31 talks about the value of a child of God. But let's first start with what is his value in the eyes of man? In the context we saw it, not being received, you will be persecuted, you will be hated. 
That's the price of you. Your price is determined by a question. Do you agree with me or not? The world says, if you do agree with me, you are valuable. If you do not agree with me, you are worthless. You will be canceled, turned off, set aside, hated. This is how they look at the child of God. Paul says when you preach Christ and him crucified, it is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And Jesus said in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Stop spreading the gospel and any biblical concept. You will be loved dearly by the world. Spread the gospel and any biblical concept. You will be hated greatly by the world. Never and ever forget the context. The first 23 verses of Matthew 10. That's the real context for us. If we consider ourselves children of God. But what's the value of a child of God in God's eyes? Jesus says in Matthew 10, 30 and also in Luke 12. Do not be afraid. Because the hairs of your head are all numbered. Are all numbered. He knows everything. He controls everything. He is in charge in every part of your life. And somehow by his Wisdom, great wisdom, works it out to the glory of his holy name. Jesus repeats this fact, this principle in Luke 21, 17 and 18. He says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. What's the real meaning of these terminologies? When we go to the Old Testament, we find this language in the Old Testament. We find it in 1 Samuel 14, 45. When when people go to King Saul, and they are talking about his son, Jonathan, and they are telling the king... There shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. And we find the same language in the book of Acts. When Paul is talking to people and saying to some sailors, saying, not a hair is to perish from the head of any one of you in Acts chapter 27 and verse 34. So this is the meaning. They who are hating you. They who don't agree with you. They who are standing against your message. Cannot touch. Cannot harm. Cannot kill your soul. They might be able to, able to kill your body. But they cannot touch your soul. No one can snatch you out of your shepherd's hand. Once saved, forever saved in his hands, protected by him and him alone. 
So now maybe it's time to clear the misunderstanding. The misunderstanding that, oh, okay, the Bible is te teaching me that I can take myself as a sparrow and God will take care of me exactly the way he takes, it, takes care of sparrows. I disagree. Because I think it's very clear in the text. We see the grace of God and two different recipients. One a bird, one a child of God. What is the bird? What is the sparrow? A sparrow, all of you know, is a living creature that is created by God. Is a living creature that was given to be ruled over by Adam. It is a living creature that does not have a spirit. It is a living creature that is not capable of having a father-child relationship with its creator. Even the God who is taking care of them in our text is not called their heavenly father. Jesus calls him your father. God is not Bert's father. God is my father. A sparrow is a living creature that is not pronounced to be a sinner in need of God's grace. A sparrow is a living creature that Jesus did not die for its salvation. We know that. All of you knew that. Okay? Yes, I can understand the language is used in the Old Testament in a very special way because in the Old Testament, there is a word in Hebrew language for bird which can be translated either bird, fowl, or sparrow. It is sipor, sipor. That word is used for, for birds. That word is used in different text in the Old Testament, yes, I'm aware of the way this word is used. David, in Psalm 84, verse 3, envies a sparrow who has found a house at the altar of Yahweh for herself where she may lay her young. I understand that. I understand Psalm 1027 when the psalmist in his distress says, I watch and I am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. And he said, in a way, he's, he's saying, I look like a sparrow. And even more in Leviticus chapter 14, we see this word is used in a ceremonial rituals to point to Christ because the priest was called to pronounce someone who had leprosy. Now he's clean to pronounce him clean. You have to have two birds, kill one of them over the running water, and then keep the second one alive. When you have hyssop, put together, dip in the water, and spread on the people, and announce them clean. And the living one, which is bloody, threw it away, let it go, and get disappeared. I understand both of these birds, both are pointing to Christ. One is talking about the way Christ will die on the cross of Calvary. The other one is talking about the fact that his death will take our sins as far as the east is from the west. But none of these texts in the Old Testament gives us any justification. To conclude, 
Or I can take myself as a sparrow and the way, the gracious way God is taking care of them, the exact way he's going to take care of me. No. Text is very clear. Text is saying, you are not sparrows. Who are you then? You are a child of God. In comparison with the sparrow who is being loved by our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You are loved by God the Father. You are, in general sense, a human being created in God's own image, but in specific sense, a child of God. Loved by the Father, loved by the Son, loved by the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, 32, He, meaning Father, who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Father, who didn't spare his son and gave it to us. He loved us. 1 John 4, 9 to 10. In this, the love of God, the Father, was made manifest among us that God sent his son, his only son, into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You are not a sparrow. You are created in the image of God, unlike the sparrow. And you are loved by the Father, God the Father. You also are loved by God the Son. Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Though he, God the Son, Jesus Christ, was in the form of God, it did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, not a sparrow. He didn't die for animals, neither for angels. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Yes, this is exactly what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. You were ransomed, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, God the Son, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. You have a great value. You are not a sparrow. You are loved by God the Father. You are loved by God the Son. And you are loved by God the Holy Spirit. Read John 14 and 16. Listen what Jesus is saying. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, dwells with you. And will be in you. Do not look at animals and think, oh, the Holy Spirit, God is in them. Come on. You are insulting the scriptures. The helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. Not a single animal, including the sparrows, are being, are guided into all the truth because the truth is Christ. Believe me, if you are a child of God, you are of more value than many sparrows. 
Believe it. In this world, when you are walking with him, when you are serving him, you will be hated. But do not be afraid. You are loved greatly by your triune God. So in the midst of all those hardships, fix your eyes on your heavenly father. Even if our flesh is being destroyed, even if they come to the point to hurt us physically and kill us, let us, just like Elizabeth, I mentioned in the beginning of my sermon, May all and every one of us boldly profess the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I would like to finish my sermon by calling your attention to a song uh, Sabrina sent me yesterday you can find it on YouTube it's a great song uh, A Sister in Christ by the name Sky Peterson S-K-Y-E Peterson she has penned this song based on Hilderberg Confession of Faith I'm going to read you two verses plus the chorus of this song She says, The one who made the heavens made my heart and soul. Before I drew a breath, I was loved and known. I am his creation, the maker's masterpiece, and all that he designs will be done in me. And if he has redeemed me, I am not my own. The measure of my worth is his love alone. He declares my standing and he declares my state. So I will know myself by the name he gave. I belong to the Lord. Oh, I'm not my own. I belong to the Lord. I am not my own. I will honor him. For this I know. I belong to the Lord. I am not my own. Beloved covenant. You are the children of the most high God. Who loved you greatly. You will have hardships. Do not deny it. Just ask a question. The right question. Do not ask me, hey pastor, if we go and preach in our neighborhood, is it going to be hard? I would say, read the Bible, it's very clear. Yes. That's not the right question. So what's the right question? This is the right question when you want to live with God, walk with him, and serve him. This is the right question. Are you with me? Is it worth it? This is the question you should ask yourself. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? People hear the gospel of salvation and come to faith. Is it worth someone who is living in sins and his death, death trespasses comes to life? Is it worth it? Is it worth it someone who was raised in the family, in the Christian family, now he's living in sin to evangelize, to share the gospel, to help him, to bring him back to the flock? Is it worth it? And I'm sure you would say, oh yeah, it is. So, you will say, it's okay. 
any hardship, any bad reaction, anything enemy wants to do against me, it's okay because it is worth it. And I will do it because I myself, I am of more value than many sparrows in his eyes. I am in him and he is in mine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how sweet is your word. When you open our minds to understand it. We don't have anything to bring, but our needs, our fears, but we praise your name. for giving us all the graces for all the situations. Yes, Father, help us to walk with you. Give us grace to work for you. And if it's your will to give us a part in sharing your suffering. We say, yes, Lord. May your name be glorified. Thank you for loving us that much. We give you all the glory and honor. In Christ's name, amen.